Welcome again to the Pyramidal Show, uh, where I need to figure out why I have an echo. Okay, now I can hear myself, and that, it's, uh, that makes it much easier to speak. Uh, so, yeah, Pyramidal, uh, where we look at the Pyramidal uh, distributed database for financial accounting and trying to understand how it works, how you could uh, how would you write a database if you set out to be a database which is like really reliable and really fast, a database which doesn't fare? Uh, so, uh, during the past few episodes, uh, we were looking at our consensus and, in particular, uh, at a repair protocol. So, uh, as a reminder, as usual, uh, the overall flow uh, of uh, data in uh, Tagabel is that there are replicas, like six computers, which communicate over each other through the network. And uh, what we try to do is that we try to come uh, to an agreement about a particular sequence of so-called prepares. So uh, replicas needs to decide, hey, okay, this prepare is the first prepare, and uh, that prepare is the second one and the third one and so on. And the like number of prepare is called an op. Each prepare internally will contain a bunch of transactions. Uh, so for example, 8,000 transfers at a time. And once uh, replicas agree on the order of prepares, they can uh, really quickly execute the actual transactions. So there are two curveballs here. The first curveball is that although uh, the order is fully linear, so uh, every prepare which gets added is numbered, and there is prepare with number n, n minus one, n plus one, there is no gaps, uh, there is no any kind of like forks or whatever. While we are deciding uh, which prepares uh, uh, should be committed, there might be many prepares in flight. So as a primary, uh, you might want to prepare prepares with ops 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, and try to uh, replicate all of them across uh, backups. And uh, you then commit those prepares in the order of confirmations uh, that you receive. Uh, so that means as a backup, you might first receive prepare number 15 from the primary and only then prepare number 11 if prepare number 11 uh, got lost in the network. The second curveball here is that 
we assume that disk can fail. So if you are a backup and you receive a prepare and you write it to disk and then you crash and restart, you might not actually be able to find this prepare on disk. It might be the case that you try to read it and the checksum just doesn't match. The disk returns some garbage data. So prepares, uh, so uh, backups need to uh, deal with that. And uh, they do it through this repair procedure. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a confusion because we will be discussing uh, repairing of prepares today. So let's dive deep into, uh, let's dive right into it. Uh, to try this uh, last time, uh, to the uh, last time and the time before that, we uh, took a really, really deep dive into how a replica goes and reads its prepare from this. We learned about IO Uring, we learned about storage, we learned about how we actually mask errors from the storage so that if uh, our storage returns some kind of an operating system error, uh, we're just saying, fine, whatever, uh, assume that the storage returns this garbage data, and then we throw the garbage data away uh, when it uh, doesn't match the checksum. Today, I want to look at the overall uh, flow which drives those prepares, which drives uh, replicas to read those prepares. And that is the repair function. So uh, this is our function repair. And the goal here is that, hey, uh, we are going to call this repair function periodically. And uh, each call to repair should try to, well, do some sort of repair. So it should try to determine which uh, piece of information is missing on the replica. Uh, and it should try to request this information uh, from uh, some other replica. First of all, uh, let's look at the call sites of this repair. How we actually, how the control flow actually gets to prepare, and the primary drive, the driver there is this on repair timeout. So uh, what's on repair timeout? That is something uh, which is driven by the tick function. So uh, let's uh, uh, look here. So uh, this is tick function uh, of our replica. And uh, if you recall correctly, uh, replica.tick is, uh, I think that font is too small here. Oh, maybe it's fine. Well, let's make it 26. I think it's, it's, it's on the small side. Yeah. So uh, if you, uh, Recall in our like main loop, uh, we basically do two things uh, infinitely. We do this replica.tick and we do this uh, IO URI run for nanoseconds, which we did a really, really thorough deep dive last week. So today we are going to look at uh, what we do in the tick, and this is actually really easy. So uh, in the tick, uh, we uh, just going to tick our timeout. Uh, and if timeout fires, uh, then we go and, uh, and invoke uh, the corresponding like, timeout handling function. So for us, this is a repair timeout, and we run on repair timeout. So let's look at what timeout actually is. So uh, timeout. Uh, I don't think I actually have a, I've ever. Uh, Look at this code, so this is new to me as well. Let's see how we initialize it. Yeah, so we initialize a repair timeout uh, with a name, uh, ID, and ID is just something we used for login. Um, and also uh, the number of ticks which the timeout uh, should fire after. And Every time we do timeout tick, there should be tick method. Yeah. 
Every time we do timeout tick, uh, we just increment uh, the number of ticks if timeout is actually active. So again, in uh, a system where you don't allocate things statically, what you would typically do is that you would allocate timeout object uh, only when you use it. And when you don't use the timeout log, you just treat. In Tiger Beetle, as usual, uh, we have a static limit on everything. And we always like uh, know exactly the objects we need to have in our memory to do anything. So that means we uh, must keep all our timeouts uh, allocated all the time. And this is exactly what you see here, like this whole uh, like page rule of code is only setting up timeouts, but timeouts might be taken or not. So uh, if the timeout is enabled, uh, the tick function increments, increments the number of ticks. And then in the function fired, uh, we check uh, that number of ticks is equal to uh, our deadline, and then we return true, uh, which in turn uh, calls uh, the relevant call. So again, let's look at uh, replica.t. Yeah, right here. So uh, this runs. Okay, yes, I need to show so many different pieces of code. So run for s. Uh, this tick is run every this amount of uh, milliseconds. And uh, if I recall, this is about like, 10 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds, uh, we are going to tick stuff. This will uh, tick our repair timeout, which will just increment the counter. So every 10 milliseconds, we are incrementing this counter. And once this repair timeout fires, which happens every after uh, ticks, uh, we uh, actually do our timeout job. And uh, we initialize repair timeout with 50 ticks. And if every tick is 10 milliseconds, that means that we try to repair every. Uh, Uh, every uh, half of a second. Uh, so yeah, uh, the question in Twitch: uh, What are we? Uh, what are we looking for, uh, for today? Uh, what are we looking at today? So today uh, we are looking at uh, the flow for repairing the state of the replica. So how a replica figures out how that it misses uh, some particular bit of information, and how this replica like, requests and prepares this missing bit of information. And uh, what we're looking at right now is that we basically say, hey, this repair procedure is just runs every half a second. And we like looked at uh, how this every half a second is implemented. Uh, one thing I don't really get here is when we reset this timeout, because if I see this correctly, yeah, in fired, we don't actually reset our ticks. So presumably, uh, presumably, yeah. Uh, let's put it on the back burner. So, uh, somewhere we should be calling this reset method on our repair timeout to actually rearm it for the next iteration. I bet this is going to be on in on a uh, repair message. Uh, no, on repair timeout. On repair timeout. Yeah. So. Uh, Let's look at uh, what we have here. Well, yeah, uh, as, uh, as, as I predicted, uh, in, in the very first callback to this repair function, the like very first step we do in this callback is that we actually reset this timeout so that in 50 ticks, we uh, again uh, go here. And uh, like uh, one thing you might be wondering, again, this is, uh, if you know, uh, this looks like very, a wrong way to deal with time because, well, uh, we run uh, our uh, event loop for 10 milliseconds and we run it like 50 times and then we call timeout. And that 
kind of like should roughly give us a timeout every half a second, but that's actually wrong because uh, the way the code written, it is prone to drift. So actually, probably because there is also some computation, every iteration of our loop is going to take a little more than 10 milliseconds. And that means that like over time, we actually like the timeouts are, are going to drift. So if we start at an even second, and uh, like the first few timeout might be at a, like zero, uh, half a second, second, a second and a half, like in that we're going to drift. But that's actually okay. Again, for things where you are very precise about time, you actually want to do something different. You want to, uh, at one point, initially compute all the instances in time where the timeout should be firing and, and fire those. You shouldn't like wait half a second more every time. But for us, because with this timeout, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in a sense, uh, we actually uh, would have extra logic to do exponential backoff when actually sending messages on the timeout. Uh, so again, this is this is kind of like one property which makes distributed uh, distributed systems easier, like classical systems, because kind of like in classical systems, systems you like need to do everything right. In distributed systems, failure uh, is inherent. In precise time, is inherent. So you already have to deal with these problems. But if you kind of like assume that your time is imprecise, then you could apply these techniques from like eventual consistency. You say, okay, I don't, I don't care when I call this timeout as long as it happens like roughly uh, every half a second. So okay. Um, but on the short of it is that uh, every half a second we are going to execute uh, this function. So yeah, first of all we check our status. I haven't just I don't think I have discussed the statuses of replica yet. It might actually be a good point. So status is uh, kind of like a big, a big classification uh, of where the replica is. And usually you are either in a normal status, so you are a primary or a backup and you're processing transaction, or you are in a view change. Uh, you are in the process of electing a new primary. But there are like two special cases. Uh, recovering is the initial state. So like when you just start up, presumably after a crash, you actually need to figure out whether you need to start in a normal uh, state or in a view change state. So you start in the recovering state and uh, figure out uh, what's, uh, what, what your real status is uh, from reading the data on disk. And then there is this also uh, recovering head status, which maybe, maybe we even uh, cover today in some detail. But the core idea here is that, well, you are a replica and you've just started and you need to repair the pairs. How do you figure out what are you repairing? Well, usually what you do is that you look at the latest prepare which you have accepted, and then you try to repair everything before that. But to do that, you actually need to know the latest thing that you have accepted. And that is important because if you you, you cannot just kind of like discard uh, the latest prepare. Like if you accepted prepare with all 92, and then you crash, and then you restart. You cannot actually, for, you are not allowed to forget that that repair was accepted. Because that ties in into this algorithm, which we'll be discussing about uh, in a couple of lectures uh, when we get to the view change. So you kind of, you really, you really need to like know the latest, the latest thing you have accepted. And it might actually be the case that due to storage failures, you might not be confident enough of that. And you might look at your, uh, when I had log, I noticed that there are some corruptions and you might be thinking like, hey, it looks like I have accepted op 92, but maybe, maybe there also was an op 93. If that is the case, which is a very rare case, you will go into this recovery head state where you need to talk to the primary and ask the primary about uh, the latest uh, state of you. But anyway, kind of like special case will probably at some point uh, dive uh, deep into it. Okay, so anyway, uh, we can only repair if we are in a normal or in a view change status. 
And additionally, uh, in a view change, uh, we uh, also require that we are a primary. So the idea here is that replicas repair when they are normal. When we are in the process of selecting a new primary, we are actually not, uh, not running repairs because when you change the primaries, you might actually truncate the lock. Uh, you might realize that, hey, we accepted uh, certain repairs under the current primary but the next primary decides that, hey, no, those prepares actually shouldn't be in the lock. Uh, and that means that we, at this point, we don't actually know what, a, what we need to repair. Unless, of course, we are uh, a replica, which is going to become the next primary. So this is, uh, this is uh, what this case is about. Uh, we are in a view change, but we are to become a primary. And in this case, before we can become a primary, uh, we actually need to repair our local lock because, well, as we are going to become a primary, we actually know which things we are going to keep and which things we are going to throw away. So in this case, we know what needs to be repaired and uh, we are going to repair it. Again, this note that this is an assertion. So uh, we don't do uh, something like this. If repair is not allowed, then just return. Uh, we actually uh, just a surface. And uh, the reason there is that if you look uh, at our repair timeout, we actually are manually starting and stopping this timeout uh, when we uh, transition between the states. So not only we have this timeout, uh, we also explicitly start and stop them at a particular state transitions and assert that a particular uh, timeout, particular concurrent processes uh, can actually run at a particular state. Okay, so uh, let's look at uh, what happens here. Uh, first of all, some assertions, I guess, uh, I'll maybe start with like written a specific assertion because it, it helps you to build a mental model uh, but once you kind of like understand the basic the basic physics of replica, kind of like most of the, those assertions become like not something you kind of like really start to understand, but just like something you expect to find there. So those are kind of like a steps on a ladder uh, which you can latch to to like double check your understanding. They kind of like they, they are sort of commands. They're sort of commands which explain uh, what happens in the queue. Uh, so, uh, let's go for this. What is OP? Well, OP is roughly the latest prepare uh, that uh, we have accepted uh, in the log. OP checkpoint is uh, the latest operation which was actually checkpointed. So, if you recall one of the first actions about consensus, maybe even the first one uh, about consensus, uh, we discussed that Although our model is a sequence of prepares, periodically uh, we want to condense uh, a slice of prepares into a checkpoint so that we have only a bounded amount of uh, information to uh, transfer over the network uh, if we need to uh, communicate with other reference. So uh, this op checkpoint is the latest check, uh, the latest op which is actually a part of a checkpoint, uh, which is the core checkpoint on Replica. And yeah, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense that your latest accepted op should be higher than your core checkpoint. Uh, what is commit mean? Well, uh, commit mean is uh, the operation, the latest operation which you have actually executed on Replica. Because as a reminder, the error flow is that as a backup, you accept a prepare. Once you accept a prepare from a primary, you actually don't know whether that prepare is going to be committed or not. Maybe a view change will happen and the next primary will truncate the prepare. It is a possibility. So uh, after you accept prepare, you reply to the primary with prepare OK message, but you don't immediately go and commit to prepare. You commit to prepare 
only once you get a commit message uh, from a primary which says that, hey, this prepare must commit. And the primary uh, sends that commit message once it received a form of prepare or case. Uh, so uh, here we uh, also uh, check every single thing that, yeah, kind of like we have. Object point, then we have self and mean, uh, then we have self commit map. Well, uh, that's actually interesting. So we have commit mean, and then we have self. Oh, oh what is commit max? So commit mean is uh, what we have physically committed on the current replica. Commit max is what we know is logically committed on the cluster. Uh, so when, uh, and basically a primary periodically broadcasts us uh, commit max. It says, hey, uh, this is uh, ops up to that can be committed. And it could actually be the case that, so okay, let's uh, this this way. It can be the case that we have commit mean, then self commit max, and then self pop. But it also could be the case uh, that pop is actually uh, before the commit max. So I think this is the normal case. Uh, this is the case where, okay, let's say that you committed ops up to 10, and then your op is 18, and commit max is 15. So uh, this means that locally you committed uh, all ops up to 10, then you know that you should commit ops up to 15, and then there are ops uh, 16, 17, and 18, uh, which you have locally, but which uh, might or might not commit in the future. So you just don't know. And uh, presumably at some point, if everything goes okay, this commit max will grow to 18, and then this commit mean also will grow to 18, and then you'll be in a steady state. Uh, this case is like slightly more, more interesting. So let's say you have op 10 uh, as a commit mean, then you have op 15 as a uh, as your op. So the latest prepare which you have accepted is 15 one, but commit commit max is 20. So here, uh, what happens is that you uh, that although you only have prepare number 15. You also know that prepares number 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 also exist. And they actually are even committed. So in this, uh, although uh, when, while the previous case was kind of in the steady state, uh, this is the case where a replica is falling behind the cluster. Uh, this is a replica uh, which knows that, hey, cluster committed a bunch of ops, and it doesn't have uh, enough ops, and, needs to, and, and it needs to repair. OK. Uh, so again, this is this is not specifically related to repair, but I will I, I will be like iterating uh, these definitions of uh, of commit mean and commit max because like really those three things are like really really key. And if you want to understand anything that happens uh, inside the replica, you kind of like really need to wrap your hand uh, wrap your head around those numbers as well. Well, as well as a new number uh, which will be covering uh, very soon. Okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, what does this mean? So, uh, okay, uh, so uh, here we have this uh, pipeline thing. So 
uh, and uh, let's say like our pipeline is four. And that means that a primary can have up to four prepares uh, in the flight, which are not yet committed. And let's say that your op currently is 20. Can you say anything about commit max here? Well, uh, because the pipeline is only four and the current op is 20, in the worst case, only ops uh, 20, 19, 18, and 17 could be in flight. Op number 16 must be committed. Because if op because if uh, op sixteen and op twenty are not committed, we have five ops in flight, and that is uh, smaller than our pipeline. So in this situation, uh, if we know op and we know our uh, if you know op, then we know a lower bound on commit max. Commit max should be uh, greater than op minus in this case sixteen which is op minus uh, minus equal uh, pipeline prepared few marks. And uh, this is exactly uh, what we do here, except that this turn uh, seal style is actually, I uh, should probably, can I disable the truth here because this will be confusion. Yeah, so uh, this was uh, actually only a ligature for uh, minus and pipe, and in zig minus in pipe uh, means uh, saturating, saturating sub subtraction. So uh, in the first graph of the log, when the op is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, of course, uh, this is going to overflow. And here we say don't overflow this. Uh, so three to zero. Uh, like an equivalent way to say this would be something like this, I think. Although I'm not actually, I'm not actually sure uh, that it is valid to add to ops because, uh, well, technically, could we overflow the op? I, I guess, uh, I guess uh, we don't try to protect uh, against it because ops are 64 bits and ops are sequential, so there is like no way we actually could overflow the op actually. Are op 64? Yeah, op 64 bits. So we don't we don't necessarily need to uh, worry about overflow here. Uh, but anyway, uh, with this great subtraction, it is definitely uh, definitely correct. Okay. Uh, then uh, another common invariant. Like what? Like what does it mean uh, that op is like is prepared? Well, it means that the replica. Uh, has at least the header of this operation. So uh, we can uh, jump to journal and see that, hey, uh, we are looking at the header and headers in the journal are always in memory. So we are looking at the header at the slot, which corresponds to the current op, because uh, headers are ring buffer. Okay, so uh, then uh, there is some garbage collection for staging, uh, which we'll be covering once we get to staging. Uh, then this interesting case, uh, which will probably just fall for uh, because this is a special case. So, okay. Uh, as I've said, uh, when we when we discuss recovery head a little bit, uh, the op is kind of like the latest prepare uh, that you have accepted. But uh, what if you know from say commit max that there are higher ops? So you want to like uh, you want to get uh, you want to get ops 
higher than what you have. Uh, the trick here, though, is that our prepares are hash chain. So if you look at the prepare, okay, let's message here. here. If you look at the prepare, prepare not only includes the checksum of what the current prepare, it also has a checksum of a part prepare. And uh, this is very powerful. And this is exactly the thing we are going to use to drive repairs. Uh, so we start from our header, which we have, right? Right here, we are certain that we have uh, this uh, header. And then we'll go in to look at this parent checksum and check whether we have it prepared. And if we don't have it prepared, we request it. And because we know the checksum, uh, we can guarantee that once we receive the data, we can verify cryptographically that it is indeed the prepare we are looking for. So in a sense, if you know the head of, you actually know the full history after this point. And this is a very powerful endeavor. And the question arises, well, uh, what do we do uh, if uh, we kind of like have the op, but you also know that we should repair beyond it, that there is some a higher number of repair uh, which we should get. Uh, what do we do in this case? Uh, the answer here is, well, uh, we're going uh, to ask the replica, which for sure knows uh, which ops uh, are correct. And that is the primary point view. Uh, so, because like we, we don't want to ask like any arbitrary replica, uh, because we don't have like in contrast to usual repair, we don't have this like hash chain hash chain in here. We really need to trust uh, that machine which tells us, hey, kind of like this is this is the next stop. So uh, we, we are going to uh, check the primary here. We're going to ask this uh, request start you. Uh, to the primary, uh, but we'll probably uh, skip this for today. Okay, so uh, assume we actually uh, assume we actually have the fresh op, so we know like what is like the latest the latest state, and we need to just prepare everything that's missing. So how can we uh, how can we figure out uh, what's missing? Well. Uh, we'll just go and find the latest killer break. Uh, we know that uh, the latest op is well our op. Uh, the earliest op, or we should be starting to look uh, for the break, is essentially like lower bound from our uh, journal. So again, as usual, everything is bounded in capacity. So our journal is of a fixed size. There is uh, only like a fixed size buffer of prepares which we are appending. Uh, it is specified in the constants. Yeah, there is like this uh, journal slot count. Uh, this is like how many uh, how many prepares there are uh, in our log. So if our current op is op, then roughly, and this is like very hand waving. This is actually trickier in reality, but roughly. You should try to find the breaks between op minus journal slot count and the op, uh, which is again this is wrong. Uh, we'll, we'll make it more precise once we get there. Okay, so let's look how we actually find this uh, latest hitter break. Um, so this should be uh, relatively simple. Uh, what we return? Yeah, uh, we return hitter range. I think this is an inclusive. A range of iterations, an inclusive range of ops, uh, which we don't actually have in the journal, uh, and like that means that we don't even have cheaters for those iterations. Uh, this is a question cheaters range, so this uh, might be an option, and uh, another term here means that there isn't actually any cheater, so we do have. All the headers between uh, this op, the earliest op, and the latest op. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, we start with uh, our uh, op max, 
And again, this is kind of like standard standard uh, zig video for uh, counting down. So you start with uh, upper bound plus one, then you write uh, condition like naturally uh, while uh, greater than lower bound, and you decrement at the start of the loop. Okay, uh, we find uh, this here. And if the reason, yeah, if there, uh, if there is no uh, that's here, well, that means that the break starts right here. So B is probably uh, uh, it's it's it isn't clear what is B the op after op marks to now because we only exact well probably B is kind of yeah probably B is like the previous op or like the uh, first op where we have a break. Okay, uh, let, let's try to understand. Uh, okay, and range. Range is our return value, so anywhere we assign range, uh, we uh, say okay, this is this is this is actually our our break. What do we do with the range? <laughs> Okay, yeah. tricky, tricky function. Uh, we need to uh, we, we need to read it carefully. Okay. Uh, okay. So first of all, assertion assertions help. Uh, we know that this uh, like that A and B are consecutive hops. Yeah. So yeah, A and B are consecutive. And uh, NB, uh, NB are connected. And uh, what's more, we actually know uh, because uh, op max is our op that the very first time we get here, we actually do uh, get the op because uh, the latest op is always in the joint. Okay, so I'll uh, just directly go here, then we don't go into if B, and the folding here is not helpful at all, like bad code folding is one of like the biggest, biggest issues with this code. Okay, so we go here, and we don't have a range yet, and then we just say, okay, uh, these are our previous op. So uh, the first iteration of this loop is like just going to be uh, just going to be trivial. We essentially set B to the header for the latest op. For the second iteration, uh, we actually are going to have both A and B, and we are going to hit this assert. We aren't going to have this range. So we don't, uh, we haven't found a break yet. Then, If a checksum equals b parent, uh, we actually know that hey, this isn't a break. This is this is completely valid. Uh, two ops in the log, uh, they are consecutive. Uh, they have correct checksums, so it, it's all check, uh, checks out. But uh, we can additionally uh, uh, verify that uh, b view is bigger than a view. So uh, yeah, kind of like going a little bit back. Uh, the protocol we implement here is uh, view stamp duplication. The idea here is that uh, every uh, prepare gets tagged with uh, two numbers. It gets tagged with an op number and with a view number. And they are compared it's graphically. First we compare views and then we compare ops. So there might actually be two different prepares for the same op. But there is a uh, but uh, among the different repairs, the one with the higher view wins. So for uh, two consecutive repairs, views should be uh, non decreasing. Okay. Mm. 
if uh, their reason, if their, uh, if this isn't actually a connection. Okay, this is actually a little bit confusing. I think we should say just okay. If uh, checksum is equal, then it's okay. Else, we should just assert that a view isn't equal to b view. Because if we have to Uh, if we have two consecutive pairs from the same view, they are generated from the same primary. And the primary must ensure that they connect to each other. Uh, so the only, uh, if we have to prepare the log and there is a break, uh, it must be the case that uh, there is a view change between them and that one of those prepares is going to get replaced by a new primary. So if we hit uh, this case, uh, we actually say that hey, this is uh, this is the break. Uh, our uh, A is the first repair, which is incorrect, and this is uh, what we need to repair. Okay. So uh, what haven't we uh, looked at yet? Uh, yeah, we, we haven't uh, looked at this case where we are extending the range. So, okay. Here, <laughs> it, it's actually, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting. I, I actually did like, so, okay, we, we found like, we found an op uh, which is definitely missing. The question is, well, uh, how can we understand if the next op uh, is missing or not? Because, well, normally we check a hard chain but if our previous op is already the wrong one, uh, we can't actually uh, hash, uh, we can't actually use hash chain. So we should uh, we should use something else. Okay, I guess that if we uh, get all the way up to a committed op, then uh, it must be correct. Uh, so we uh, break with whatever range we have. Okay, aha, this is interesting. So uh, if op is connected to a parent op, but we know that the parent op is wrong, uh, then the current op uh, also should be wrong. Actually, uh, I'm actually wondering if that's really the case because, well, it feels like, like I mean, uh, they might be connected, but uh, the older op might still be, uh, uh, might still be correct, you, you, you might, have uh, removed only the latest one, but yeah, again, uh, it, it makes sense to verify. Okay, then if we have another break, and it is even from the older view, uh, okay, so uh, th this one actually I also, I don't think I fully, fully, fully understand. I kind of like understand this one. So uh, we are like arriving through a break, and we found an op with a view higher than the current break. That means, yeah, uh, that definitely means that uh, every op in the current break is like completely wrong. We should replace those because we found out uh, something from uh, the first view. Uh, but if our view is before and we are not connected, it also feels like it might be uh, might be correct. But again, I guess it doesn't really matter if we uh, conservatively uh, include some ops which are actually correct. Uh, the, the important bit is that like uh, right here, if there is a first break we detect. Okay, anyway, so let's get back to repair. Uh, okay, 
it's in replica. Yeah. So uh, if we uh, found uh, a range of headers, uh, which we uh, which we are missing, then uh, we go to we are going to ask some other replica to give us headers uh, between those two ops. So we figured out that there is a break in our hash chain, and we ask someone, "Hey, please uh, mend us the break." And we only ask uh, we only ask for headers, and then we kind of stop because until we uh, fix the hash chain of the headers, it doesn't really make sense for us to go and fix the bind as well. I guess we could do this concurrently potentially, uh, but still, like figuring out uh, the hashes of what we need is more important than figuring out the borders. So if we get all the way up to here, it means that we have an intact hash chain from uh, the earliest of we must repair up to the latest stop we are accepted. So our life has changed should be uh, much simpler. Uh, we just uh, start with uh, like the status op, do this uh, standard uh, counter loop down, uh, and uh, just assert that hey, there is uh, uh, there is a chain here. Okay. So. Uh, now that we actually, actually, let's. Uh, uh, I wanted to to skip uh, uh, talking about request headers, but I think, but I think there is there is no way around. So okay, uh, we are sending. Um, we are asking some other replica for headers. This replica uh, will run on request headers function. And again, like for every like message type, there is all message type handler function, which is like relatively easy. So it is going to copy out the headers, uh, which will uh, probably look closer at uh, in a week. And it's going to send us uh, Going to send us here, yeah. It's going to send us here's message. So then we back as a repair replica. We are going to run the code uh, in on headers handler. We are going to iterate the actual headers, and uh, we're going to repair a header. And uh, repairing a header means that we are going to essentially insert header in the jar. Again, we'll look at this logic uh, in more detail uh, in a week. But what I want to show here is that uh, when we insert a header in a journal, we go and, uh, well, actually insert a header in the journal, and then we set a jargon. So th this is this is what, what I was uh, looking for. The place uh, where we say, hey, uh, we have a header for this prepare, but we don't yet have the full body. So uh, we still have to go to someone else and tell them, hey, please, uh, send, send me the whole prepare. So I, I know it's hash. So when you send me your data, I will actually be able to double check that you send me exactly what I was looking for, because I already know the hash. I already have the header, but I don't have the actual prepare. So uh, if we have these, uh, if we have any dirty bits, if we have some headers which are missing repairs, we are going to repair, repair. And here, uh, we are going to okay, this is some special case for just uh, rotten journal, so let's give it. Uh, I guess uh, th th that's the main thing. So, first of all, like uh, we know that there are some holes in our journal. How many prepares uh, we can repair? Well, it is uh, kind of uh, difficult to say, but one thing we can look at is that we could uh, look at the number of write IOPS which are available. And again, 
everything in Tiger Beetle has a limit. So we know the maximum number of concurrent writes that the journal can service. Uh, and uh, we could uh, compute how many uh, are we uh, not servicing right now. And that's, and, then, and that's going to be our budget. Then we're going to trade uh, through our entire uh, ring buffer of right hand log, which is bounded in size, so it trades through the entire thing. This is actually uh, all that long. And we're going to find slots which are dirty, which have this dirty bit set, which we set here once we receive a header we prepare. And um, Uh, if this bit is dirty, uh, then we go uh, to uh, request this prepare and to determine this budget. So when we request a prepare, we uh, uh, get a checksum. We maybe try to find prepare uh, already in memory. Uh, so for example, if we, it might be the case that uh, I think that uh, we attended uh, this here to the journal, that then we get a prepare not as uh, a response to our request, but well, maybe, maybe like primary status prepare, or maybe it was just like too slow to get from the network. So we kind of like already inserted uh, prepare into our cache, and then we kind of like tidy this memory, or maybe yeah, we're just like writing this prepare right now. But yeah, kind of like in, uh, for like real uh, repair case, uh, we probably aren't going to find it anywhere. And then we're going to fire up this request prepare, uh, uh, request prepare request, which is exactly uh, what we uh, looked at uh, two episodes before. So we looked at on uh, request prepare, uh, where we, yeah, uh, where we went to the journal and tried to read the prepare to help some other replica repair. And I stress the fate uh, when we are repairing this prepare, we already have a check, which is like not entire, not entirely of our repair pipeline, but I think that it should give you uh, should give you a good sense. Again, uh, in the next episode, we go into uh, that deeper. But uh, let me recap what we covered today. So, uh, repair. The job of repair is to go and uh, fix uh, everything that's missing. Uh, repair generally just runs on a time. Like every half a second, Rebecca tries to repair something if it uh, notices that there is uh, a missing bit of information. Uh, repair is conceptually three processes. So first of all, uh, we must advance our head. Uh, we must, uh, like, if we know that the cluster is far ahead of us, we want to get this latest prepare. We want to get the tip of the current view. Uh, to do that, we ask the primary for primary headers. Uh, once we know that our head op is uh, fresh enough, we want to uh, repair everything that's beyond that. Uh, repairing all prepare before our head op, in turn, consists of repairing all the heaters and then, then repairing all the prepares. And uh, we do those two operations sequentially. So first of all, uh, we want to get the intact hash chain uh, from beginning of our log to our current op. Uh, and by hash chain, I mean the hash chain of headers, because each header contains uh, the checksum of the previous header and also the full checksum of the body. So after we, and to do this operation, we issue a request headers request against uh, some other a different fabric. And then we get the headers back and we install them in the journal and we mark corresponding prepares as dirt. So after we fix our hash chain, we fix our headers, uh, we know what prepares should be uh, 
in our state. We know they are hashes because headers contain hashes of a bias, but we don't necessarily have the actual pairs. That's where we trigger this uh, request prepare flow, where we uh, look at those prepares which are missing, but for which we already have a header, and we uh, take a checksum from this header, pick up uh, some other replica, and uh, say, uh, hey, please uh, give me uh, give me a prepare with uh, this checksum. And I think this covers it for today. Again, we didn't get to the entire repair flow, but I think right now like, you, sh you should understand that this, this big picture with these timers and like, repairing head and repairing headers and repairing bodies. Uh, so next time we'll just dive uh, deeper into it. So please uh, join me uh, next Thursday at 5 p.m. Uh, on Twitch uh, and well, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. UDC. Uh, where we'll be diving even deeper into repair. Thanks for watching today. And let me say goodbye. <laughs>